How much do you know about Cinco de Mayo? Let's take a little quiz. True or false? Question number one, true or false? Cinco de Mayo is celebrated on the 5th of May. True. Cinco de Mayo, 5th of May. Today is May 5th. We celebrate Cinco de Mayo. Good. Question number two. Cinco de Mayo is celebrated throughout the Spanish-speaking world. False. It is strictly a Mexican holiday, not celebrated in Spain or Guatemala or Peru or Argentina. Strictly a Mexican holiday. Question number three. Cinco de Mayo is a celebration of Mexican Independence Day. In the way we celebrate the 4th of July in the United States, Mexicans celebrate the 5th of May as their Independence Day. False. That is not true. Mexican Independence Day is September 16th, not May 5th. One more question. Cinco de Mayo is a major holiday in Mexico. False. It is not. It is not a major holiday. In fact, if you were in Mexico today, you would barely realize that it's a special day. You would hear very little talk about today being a holiday. Well, if it's not a major holiday in Mexico, why do we celebrate it and hear so much about it here in the United States? Well, here it has become an excuse for us to go to Mexican restaurants. Remember when we used to go to restaurants? To go to Mexican restaurants and eat tacos and, and do other things. And it's also been a day to recognize and remember and celebrate Mexican culture and Mexican heritage here in the United States. So it's a positive holiday, even if it is sometimes misunderstood. Well, what is Cinco de Mayo really? It's really the celebration of a battle a battle that happened in the city of Puebla, Mexico in 1862, a battle between the French and the Mexicans. And the French army arrived. Uh, they were collecting some debts that Mexico owed them and really looking to expand their empire. And there were 6,000 highly trained French soldiers that arrived at the city of Puebla for this battle. And defending the city was the Mexican army, which was really not an army at all. It was 2,000 Mexican people, many of them indigenous, not well trained, uh, not very well supplied, vastly outnumbered. And they had no business winning this battle, but they did. With merely 100 casualties, they successfully defended their city, pushed the French away, and won this victory. And it became a symbolic victory throughout the entire nation, and it became a rallying cry for Mexican people throughout the country. Well, in God's word, we see examples of God winning unlikely victories as well. We see several examples. And we're going to look at one today from the book of Joshua. And you know the story of Joshua. Joshua was in charge of leading God's people into the promised land. And to do so, they had to cross the Jordan River. And when they crossed it, God separated the water so the people could walk across the dry land into the promised land. And after that happened, we see in chapter 4 of Joshua, we see this. So Joshua called together the 12 men he had appointed from the Israelites, one from each tribe, and said to them, Go over before the ark of the Lord your God into the middle of the Jordan. Each of you is to take up a stone on his shoulder according to the number of the tribes of the Israelites to serve as a sign among you. In the future, when your children ask you, what do these stones mean? Tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. These stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. So when God won this unlikely victory, when God did this incredible thing, his people built an altar. Something that we can still do today. We can build altars altars to the things that God has done in our lives. Why would we do that? Why would we build an altar? Well, the present can be foggy and the present can be confusing. We know that well in these days and sometimes we lose sight of what God is doing. But if we see an altar of, of what God has done in the past and the victories that he has won and where he showed up when we least expected it, we remember that he is in control. He has won in the past and he will win in the future. Our God is in control. And altars also help tell God's story. And they help to show how the God part of our story is so vital. We can share with others if we can easily point to specific times or experiences or places where God showed up. It's easier for us to share with others who God is and what he is doing. Well, when do we build altars to God? We build altars when God protects us when God delivers us, when God provides for us. 
When he does, does those things, when we least expect it, and he shows up and he protects or he delivers or he guides or he provides, we build an altar. And, and how do we do that? Do we, do we build a statue out of stones like they did in the book of Joshua? You could. You could build an altar of stones in your backyard or in your basement or in your living room. Or there's other ways we can build altars to God. We have cell phones uh, with calendars on them. And, and you can set a reminder every month or every year for a reminder of a time when God did something great in your life. Or, or on social media, on Facebook or something, you can set a reminder to remind you when God did something. Or you can recognize a place. Maybe if you encountered God outside in the woods or in your basement or somewhere, you can do something physical and set something physical there that every time you see it, you're reminded of what God has done in your life and reminded that God is in control still. In the book of Joshua, it said, in the future, when your children ask you, what did these stones mean? Tell them of what God did. So when we or others see our altars and say, what does that mean? We can tell them about the incredible things that God has done in our lives. And it can become our rallying cry.